Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that the Lord has kept you well and you are doing fine in the Lord. And once again, we are right here with our class. Thank you very much, students, even for coming and availing yourself. Your commitment even to study is not in vain, but our good Lord will reward you. So at this time, as we begin the class today, I just want us to begin with a word of prayer as we move on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we bless you. Thank you for each and every student of the word. Lord, bless us and refresh us. We are praying that, Lord, you may revive and rejuvenate us, refresh our minds once again by your word, and all the glory shall be to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, beloved. And once again, we want to start our class today. And we are right uh, still doing the New Testament survey. And as per this time, we want to move on with the Pauline episodes. So let us begin the New Testament survey. New Testament. Survey. And we are still doing the Pauline episodes. The Pauline Epistles, and we are today going to look at the book of Hebrews. And the author is Apostle Paul. Well, there has been uh, discussions going on and a lot of people are asking us to really who wrote this episode and there was some suggestion from different scholars of which we can see that uh, some people were trying to say it might be Apollos some were saying that it might be Barnabas some were saying it's Silas some say it's Philip and others also say that uh, perhaps it was written by Priscilla and Aquila. But all this, regardless of the human hand that held the pen, the Holy Spirit of God is the divine author of all scripture. That one we know, and you can look at it from this book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And therefore, Hebrews speaks with the same canonical authority as the other 65 books of the Bible. We all know that the Bible has got 66 books and this New Testament alone has got 27 books. And this book of Hebrews has canonical authority. As we had seen before, canon is the criteria which was used to write or include the books which were included in the Bible. And so, it has been confirmed that uh, Hebrews was written by Paul, although some also had their own suggestions and thoughts, and some were saying maybe it's Dr. Luke, but all in all, it was written and it's being ascribed to Paul, the apostle. Let's look at the date and setting for this book, and we can see that... Uh, there are different suggestions as well. The early church father Clement quoted from the book of Hebrews in AD 95. However, internal evidence such as the fact that Timothy was alive at the time the episode was written and the absence of any evidence showing the end of the Old Testament sacrificial system that occurred with Jerusalem uh, with Jerusalem's destruction in AD 70 indicates the book was written around AD 65. 
In short, what it's trying to say uh, is that uh, this book of Hebrews was written when Timothy was still alive. And that rules out the probability of the book be having been written uh, much later in AD 95, whereby uh, the apostle or the saint or the pastor Timothy was already dead. And so we can see that probably it was written in AD 65. AD 65. That's the date and setting for the book of Hebrews. And again, we want to look at the purpose as to why this letter was written. And uh, the purpose as to why it was written. Purpose as to why this letter was written. We can see that Hebrew was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews. Of course, Paul was a Hebrew and he was writing to the Hebrew. And that one again can rule it out that it's not Timothy because Timothy was a Gentile. As we had seen before, he was a Hellenist Jew. So it rules him out. He is telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. Hebrews to stop acting. As Hebrews. Well, what does this mean when you say Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews? In short, the letter wanted the Hebrews to act as the saints, people who are believers, people who are born again, because they were not expected after getting salvation that they should again go back to the old traditions <clears throat> the uh, old traditions of the Judaizers with the legalistic mind, with all the law they used to keep and to struggle so hard so as to attain justification by works. But Paul wanted the Hebrews to stop acting as Hebrews and live as Christians. This one make, uh, means a lot to us because a lot of people even in today's world are like, uh, they are not out of their own traditions and out of their own things, their own gods, their own ancestral gods, and all these kind of things. But uh, we who are believers in Jesus Christ, we are children of God and we are expected to live as God's people. And we can see another purpose as to why it was written is that many of the Jewish believers were slipping back into the rites and rituals of Judaism in order to escape the mounting persecution. Uh, not to slide back. not to slide back not to slide back paul was writing so as to encourage believers not to slide back simply because there was severe persecution and so a lot of christians were tending to go back because the judaizers were like persecuting the church so that they can forsake the new faith of Christian faith, and they should go back to their own traditional uh, backgrounds, to their own traditional gods, and to their own legalistic minds. And with all those kind of things, it wasn't acceptable in the new faith of Christianity. And so this letter was written, so us, to encourage believers who are sleeping back into the rites and rituals of Judaism 
in order to escape mounting persecutions. So uh, again, another thing we can see is exhortation for those persecuted believers. Exhortation, that's another good point. Exhortation. Another good point is that Paul was writing to exhort the believers uh, in Christ. He was writing to exhort those who are persecuted believers to continue in the grace of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing at all should take you back. Nothing, nothing at all should make you slid back, but hold on to the faith. No matter how difficult it may be, no matter how tough or severe the persecution, but you are expected to maintain the Christian faith. We want to look at the key verses. The key verses. We want to look at the key verses. One of the key verses in this book of Hebrews is Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 2. And that scripture says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. In the old days, God used to speak to our forefathers through the prophet and in many diverse ways. But these days, he's speaking to us through his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Another key verse is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Chapter 2 and verses 3. And we can see that it says, How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? That one is another key verse. We need this salvation. And I want to testify that uh, when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is this verse that the pastor who was preaching to me read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 7. And uh, he said that God wants you to accept salvation and not to be stiff-necked just as your forefathers did in the wilderness and uh, they all perished. So when I heard of this scripture, it moved my heart and I decided to give my life to Jesus Christ many years ago. And I want to testify that God has been faithful. And we can see again, it's a very key verse in this book of Hebrews because Paul is saying, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? There is no way out for you. The only way is Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Another key verse is Hebrews chapter verse 11 Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 11 and we can see it says uh, therefore since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold firm to the faith we profess for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. That one is powerful. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence because our sins are forgiven. Our failures were dealt with. Our shame 
our worries, our trouble were fixed right on the cross when he said it is finished in John chapter 19 and verses 30. All is finished. Every curse, every wickedness, every generational curses, every failures in life, worries, tribulations, all were dealt with right on the cross. And that's why it says, therefore, let us approach the throne of grace, the throne of grace with confidence, because we are his children. And that one goes up to verses 16, 11 to 16. Let us look at another key verse, which is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1, what does the Bible say? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain or certainty of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. That's faith. We believe that Jesus Christ came. We were not yet in existence. But we believe that he came and he lived on earth. He died. He was crucified and he died. He rose again and is living forever. That's faith. Me and you, it's faith. We believe. And we can have the assurance as we can see from the words and the witness of the apostles who even lived and died for the same gospel. Later on, we shall look on how the apostles died and where they died, perhaps. And we can see that there is this other verse again, which is a key verse in Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. And you can go up to verse 2 there. You will see, therefore, since we are surrounded by much great cloud of witnesses let us therefore throw off let us therefore throw off what should we throw off let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us let us fix our eyes onto Jesus. Don't fix your eyes onto the things of this world. Fix your eyes onto Jesus. Fix your mind onto Jesus. Fix your heart onto Jesus. And the author and the perfecter of our faith. Wow, that's powerful. Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter of our faith. What do we have to do? We have to keep on in him. We have to keep on trusting and relying on him. He is worthy even to give our lives to him. Because in him we are safe. And he is saying, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wow, wow, wow. What an amazing scripture is this that jesus christ is seated down right on the hand right hand of god the father you and me we are his children and he promised that someday sometime he will come back so that where he shall be we shall also be where there will be no trouble there will be no crying anymore sorrowing but full of joy forever and ever through eternity. Let's go to the brief summary of this book. Brief summary. Brief summary. The book of Hebrews addresses three separate groups, three separate groups. 
let's talk of three groups group number one is the believers in Christ believers in Christ those who have accepted the gospel fully they are believers they are in Christ and we can have a look also at unbelievers that's a second group unbelievers we are having unbelievers who are these unbelievers people who had knowledge of and an intellectual acceptance of the facts of Christ there were those who doesn't believe but they have knowledge about Christ they have intellectual acceptance of the facts of Christ but they don't believe yet and we have the third group also who are unbelievers who are attracted to Christ unbelievers who are attracted to Christ attracted to Christ unbelievers attracted to Christ unbelievers attracted to Christ unbelievers attracted to Christ but who rejected him ultimately it's important to understand which group is being addressed in which passage to fail to do so can cause us to draw conclusion inconsistent with the rest of the scripture uh, something else to note is that the writer of hebrews continually makes mention of the supremacy of christ the writer continually mentions the supremacy of christ in both his person and in his ministering work both in person and in his ministering work and uh, that's something also to note down in the writings of the old testament we understand the rituals and ceremonies of judaism symbolically pointed to the coming of messiah in other words the rites of judaism were but shadows of things to come and hebrew tells us that christ jesus is better than anything 100% sure jesus christ is better than anything else and is better than just mere religion so don't brag about your religion brag about jesus christ and the fact that your sins are forgiven don't even brag because demons are obeying you brag because your names are written in heaven jesus spoke to his disciples when they came back so happy and uh, overjoyed and they were like hey demons are obeying us in your name they thought that was a very great news to jesus christ otherwise they were proved wrong because jesus said to them don't rejoice because demons are obeying you that one is accept, accepted and that one is expected but rejoice that your names are written in heaven before you preach to others make sure your name is written in heaven before you offer any services to god make sure your name is written in heaven before you cast out demons or perform great miracles signs and wonders make sure that your sins are forgiven and that your names are written in the book of life and he jesus christ is more than religion however big your religion might be jesus is bigger than every religion and we can see that uh, all and under any circumstance of religion in comparison to the person work and ministry of christ jesus there is nothing in comparison because he is above far above all no matter what your religion offers you jesus is above it 
it is the superiority of our Lord Jesus, then that remains the theme of his eloquently written letter. Wow, powerful. Now, let's go on and look at the practical application. Practical application. We have something to apply into our own lives and this is the purpose as to why this letter was written. Practical application. Rich in foundational Christian doctrine, that's number one. Rich in foundational. Foundational Christian living. Rich in foundational Christian living. That's one thing that we can apply in our today's life, something that we can hold on to. And number two is to give us encouraging examples of God's faith heroes. Examples of God's faith heroes. This book gives us examples of God's faith heroes. Here is where you find it's mentioned about the men of faith who by faith trusted God and greater things happened, who preserved in spite of great difficulties. In adverse circumstances, God preserved them by faith and that one you can always find it in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11.1. You'll see there how men uh, and people were preserved by God who trusted him. In adverse circumstances, God was there with them in great difficulties how you can endure. A lot of Christians today cannot endure persecution, and especially if it comes to flesh. In very small persecution, they are very ready to give up their faith. And uh, we can see that the men in these days, they could not give up their faith until death. In today's world, if a pastor is arrested, that's a big deal. The rest will begin to gossip. Hey, that pastor has uh, gone away from the word of God. That's why he's been arrested. That pastor has done ABCD. That man has done ABCD because it's you, of your problem that you are, you've been arrested. Not remembering that the apostles were being arrested without any cause. Without any cause, even Jesus Christ was arrested. Was arrested. He did nothing wrong, but they arrested him. And we can see that he was even charged, but he endured it. So how much more can we endure these difficult situations, some challenges and trials? Are we giving up our faith simply because of challenges? Are we giving up our faith simply because you are jobless? Are you giving up your faith simply because your wife has left you, divorced you, your husband has divorced you? Are you giving up simply because you don't have money? Or you don't have a car like any other preacher? Are you giving up simply because things are not working for your good? 
things are against you, adverse circumstances you are facing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We must hold on. And another thing on practical application is overwhelming evidence. Overwhelming evidence as to the un unconditional surety and absolute reliability on God. Overwhelming evidence as to the unconditional surety and absolute reliability on God. We can say un unconditional. That one is great, eh? Unconditional. That one, unconditional, surety, and absolute. And absolute. Absolute reliability. Reliability. Absolute reliability of God. Can God be trusted? Certainly, yes. God can be trusted. No matter what situation, no matter what circumstance, God can be trusted. And we must trust him, of course. We must trust him. Nowhere else you can run to but to trust in God. God can be trusted and we must trust in him. Likewise, we can maintain perfect confidence. Hold on to those promises regardless of our circumstance by meditating upon the rock-solid faithfulness of God's workings in the lives of his Old Testament saints. My beloved, I adjure you by the mercies of the Lord to keep confidence in God. No matter what circumstance you are in, just believe in his promises by faith. He is never late. He will meet you at the point of your need. I want to talk about five solemn warnings we must heed. Five I want to talk about five warnings. Five warnings we must heed. Five warnings we must heed. And number one is danger of neglect. Danger of neglect. What is danger of neglect? There will be people who will neglect you simply because you are preaching the true gospel. They will disown you. They will desert you. And you will be left alone. You must take heed to this one. And that one you find it in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. Chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. We are still in the book of Hebrews. And we can also look, see the danger of unbelief. Danger of unbelief. Danger of unbelief. And that one is uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7. And you can read also chapter 4, verse 13. Also chapter 4, verse 13. Actually, it should be from chapter 3, verse 7, up to chapter 4, verse 13. You will see the danger of unbelief. And another danger is the danger of spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity, number three, spiritual immaturity, spiritual immaturity, 
spiritual maturity, you will find it in that Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11. 5 verse 11 up to chapter 6 verse 20. You will find spiritual maturity. 12 to 20. And danger number four we must take heed to is the danger of failing to endure. Failing to endure. Failing to endure. Failing to endure, you'll find it in that Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. 10, verse 26, up to verse 39. And last, lastly, you'll find the inherent danger of refusing God. Danger of refusing God. If you refuse God, you are in great trouble. That's a dangerous thing. Refusing God. Anybody that refuses God is in great danger. Very dangerous. And that's uh, chapter 12, verse 25. 12, verse 25. You can read it there up to 29. 25 to 29. Danger of refusing God. Danger of refusing God. And uh, and so we find in this crowning masterpiece, some scholars term this book as crowning masterpiece and great wealth of doctrine, a refreshing spring of encouragement. All these were names that way it was called and source of sound, practical warnings against slothfulness in our Christian walk. But there is still more, for in Hebrews we find a magnificently rendered portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our great salvation. And that one brings us to the end of the book of Hebrews, whereby we want to move on very fast. We are now done with Pauline episodes. Well, before we are done with Pauline episodes, we still have one more book here. We still have one more book, then we will be done with Pauline episodes. And this is the book, we are still in Pauline episodes. And now we look at the book of Philemon. Philemon is also among the Pauline epistles. The author of this book of Philemon is called Apostle Paul. Author is Apostle Paul. And we can see that in Philemon chapter 1 verse 1. Philemon 1 verse 1 and we can see the date and setting for this book of Philemon is approximately AD 60 AD 60 the probable dates that it was written and uh, the book has got a purpose as to why it was written purpose as to why the book was written. The book 
The letter of Philemon is the shortest of all Paul's writings. You can note that one. It is the shortest of all the letters that Paul wrote. It is the shortest of all the letters Paul wrote. It deals with the practice of slavery. Practice shortest, we've said shortest. Shortest of all Paul's writing. Paul's letters. And we can also see that it deals with the practice of slavery. Practice of slavery. Practice of slavery. It deals with the practice of slavery. The letter suggests that Paul was in prison at the time of writing. Most of these letters Paul was writing while he was in prison. And this letter of Philemon also, we can see there is evidence that uh, Paul was in prison again. And he wasn't in prison because of the wrong things he did. He was in prison because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that one. And we can see that Philemon was a slave owner. Philemon was a slave owner. Philemon was a slave owner. He was a slave owner. And uh, he was also ho he had also hosted a church in his home. Philemon had hosted a church in his home during the time of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Philemon had likely journeyed to the city. He heard Paul preaching and became a Christian. Wow, that's so great. And also the slave Onesimus. We've heard of Onesimus. This Onesimus was the slave to Philemon. And Onesimus had robbed his master Philemon and he had run away, making his way to Rome and to Paul. He ran away and luckily he just fell into the good hands. At times when you try to run away from God, God is directing you to the right hands and Onesimus just landed into the hands of Paul. And Paul was preaching, was preaching powerfully about Jesus Christ and he touched the heart of Onesimus. And Onesimus decided to get saved and he became a Christian and we can see that now the slave Onesimus after getting saved now Paul himself Onesimus was still the property of Philemon as we know that uh, once you had bought a slave he had to remain under your custody as your slave until he fulfills the uh, traditions and the rules and regulations of uh, a slave and therefore, having gotten saved, he was uh, still a property of Philemon. And Paul is now writing to smoothen the way for his return to his master. This is why Paul wrote this uh, letter of Philemon, uh, writing to Philemon that, hey, Philemon, these are some of the words Paul wrote in, a, in the process of smoothening the way for Onesimus to return to his master, Onesimus. Uh, to his master Philemon and he said through Paul's witnessing to him Onesimus had become a Christian and that one you'll see it in Philemon 10. Philemon 10. Philemon has got only one chapter so it's uh, that verse 10 you'll see and Paul wanted Philemon to accept Onesimus as brother in Christ and not merely as a slave. Philemon the purpose was to Restore Onesimus, Onesimus to his master, to his master. Since Onesimus was a slave to Philemon, Paul had to write this letter to instruct on the way forward. 
because you know somebody has robbed you, you must be beat about it. And now you are hearing that this guy has just come to the Lord and is now a Christian. I just find this one to be so interesting. And Paul wrote this letter and uh, pleaded with Onesimus to accept Onesimus as a brother, not only just as a slave, but also as a Christian. Let's look at the key verses. Let's look at the key verses. Let us look at the key verses. In verse 6 of Philemon, verse 6, we've said it only have got uh, one chapter. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And another key verse is Philemon 16. So that's 6. Now we are in 16, where Paul is saying, no longer is a slave, but better than a slave. Wow. Ah, this is so great indeed. Eh? Receive him no longer as a slave, but than a slave, better than a slave. Uh, certain musicians sang and said, I'm no longer a slave to sin. So this is where maybe he derived his uh, inspiration. No longer is a slave, but better than a slave. As a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Receive him because he is so dear to me and much more to you as a brother in the Lord. Uh, why Paul was saying this is because Onesimus had lived with Philemon for some times. And so Philemon understood Onesimus more than Paul. And Onesimus understood Philemon more than Paul. So God is using Paul just as a mediator to stand in between them. And that's why we can see he's saying that he's so dear to me, but much more to you. And we can go to verse 18 as well. Verse 18, again, we see, If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. <laughs> May God bless this man of God, Apostle Paul. He's saying, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. You can imagine, and we've just seen that Onesimus had robbed his master Philemon and he took off. But now he's a believer in Christ, and Paul is reconciling the situation. And he's saying that, uh, receive him. And if he owes you anything, charge it on to me. Wow, this has reminded me way back, some years ago, I had uh, known a certain young man, and uh, I only knew him for a span of like two weeks, even before a month ended. It happened that I heard some noise outside my office and the rowdy youths were shouting, kill him, kill him. And when I opened the door to see what was going on, I realized that it's the young man that I had just known and they wanted to lynch him. When I asked what's wrong, then they said, this guy has robbed us. This guy has robbed us, and I was like, what has he robbed you? What has he taken from you? Then they said, he took some money from us, and today we've caught him. We, we must kill him, and we must uh, lynch him. And the guy had no shoes already. These guys had beaten him up. And when I intervened in the matter, by that time I had no single coin in my pocket. But I just intervened and said, please, I urge you, let's go to the authorities and sign down that I will pay you this money. Please don't lynch him. And the guys were, yes, that's what we wanted. 
if not that way, we lynch him. Then I said, don't lynch him. I'll pay you. Let's go to the authorities. We went to the authorities and we signed and we had agreed how the mode of payment, which I did, and God was so faithful that this young man lived again. Although I never saw him again after that time, he disappeared. But my greatest joy is that I saved his life as per that moment. And so Paul is saying, whatever he owes you, count it on me. Let's go to the brief summary of this book of Philemon. Summary of the book of Philemon. Summary of the book of Philemon. Paul had warned slave owners that they had a responsibility towards their slaves. Paul had warned slave owners that they are responsible uh, towards, they should be responsible towards their slaves. That's number one. And number two is that uh, he showed slaves, uh, show, showed slaves as responsible moral be beings who were to fear God. Paul was trying to bring this aspect from Christian point of view and from God's perspective that uh, let us not treat slaves as outcasts or some very bad people and kind of material, but that we should even consider them uh, people who are God's people as well with us. They are co-heirs as long as they believe in Jesus Christ. They are our brothers, they are our sisters. In Philemon, Paul did not condemn slavery, but he presented Onesimus as a Christian brother instead of a slave, which was so cool. That thumbs up, and when an owner can refer to a slave as a brother, the slave has reached a position in which the legal title of slave is meaningless. And that one refers also to the words of Jesus Christ in John, uh, whereby 17, John 17 there, whereby he's saying that I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. Because slaves may not know what his master is planning to do, but friends must know what their friends are planning to do. And we can see Paul attempted to unite both Philemon and Onesimus with Christian love so that emancipation would become necessary. Only after exposure to the light of the gospel could the institution of slavery die. Amen. May it die in Jesus' name. You will not be slaves to people in the name of Jesus. You will not be slaves to debts. You are going to be bosses in Jesus' name. You will employ others and you will treat them well in Jesus' name. You should respect your masters, those who are employed and those who are employers. You should also treat well your employees. And I want to make it clear that uh, slaves are different from employees. Employees are people with their own rights, uh, constitutional rights, and they can ask questions and they have a right to know how you pay them, how you treat them. You know slaves had no rights. Once you are a slave, you are a slave. You are entitled to hard labor and all these kind of things. So we are going to treat those, our employees, well, and God will bless us. And we can see that... Uh, they must eventually answer to God for their actions. You must answer to God for your actions. That one you can cross uh, read from Colossians chapter 4 verse 1. You must be answerable to God. How you treat your employees. If they have worked for you, pay them. Pay them. Why are you finding it hard to pay them? Yet they have worked for you. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Pay them. If you are a pastor, pay those people who are working in the church. <coughs> we have those keyboardists, we have those musicians who are full-time. Pay them. Pay them. They are serving in the altar. 
If you had any agreement about payment, then pay them. Don't throw them away when they ask for their money. Don't kick them out of the church when they ask for their pay because you will be answerable to God and anybody in authority and God will bless you so much. So we are moving on and now we want to, we've already concluded the Pauline episodes. Now we are going to move on with the non-Pauline episodes. Non-Pauline episodes. We want to go very fast and do the non-Pauline episodes. We have the non-Pauline. Non-Pauline episodes. And right now, we want to look at the book of James. We want to have a look at the book of James, which is a non-Pauline episode. And we can see that the author is this, of this book is James. Author of this book is James himself. The author of this book or episode is James, also called James the Just. James the Just, who is bought or who is thought to be the brother of Jesus Christ. This is the James who was also called the brother of Jesus Christ in Matthew 13 verse 55. Matthew 13 55, you will see it's being referred to as the brother of Jesus Christ, and also Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark 6, 3. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. You can check there. You will also see. And again, James was not a believer until after the resurrection. John wasn't a believer until after resurrection. If you want to confirm that, you'll see in John 7, 3. John 7, 3. John 7, verse 3. And you can go up to 5, verse 5. Up to verse 5. He wasn't a believer until after resurrection. And there are some other more scriptures to prove all these points. And uh, maybe I'll, I promised I'll be giving you notes after the course is done. So I'll hand you over all these notes in soft copy and you can refer to them. But meanwhile, you have to write your own notes because the more you write your own notes, the more it sink deeper into your mind and into your heart and you catch it well because uh, it sings and it gives inspiration to you. So I won't mention the rest of the scriptures here, but I'll give them to you as notes. He also became the head of the Jerusalem church. This same James is the one that became uh, over the Jerusalem church. He was the pastor there and he was the overseer and is mentioned first as a pillar of the church. He's mentioned as a pillar of the church and that one in Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 it mentioned James as the pillar of the church the date and setting for this book or probably when this book was written is early AD 45 AD 45 early AD 45 before the first council of Jerusalem, before the first council of Jerusalem. Later on, we are going to, we will be going through Christian 
or church history. And through church history, you'll understand what it means when I'm saying the first council of Jerusalem, which was in AD 50. James was martyred in approximately AD 62. That's when he was killed, AD 62. AD 62. AD 62, he was killed. AD 62, he was killed, he was martyred. He didn't do anything wrong, but because he was preaching Jesus Christ, they killed him. And uh, he died through uh, a way that they beheaded him. He was beheaded, according to the historian Josephus, Josephus, and we want to look at the purpose of writing, purpose as to why it was written. The purpose as to why this book was written. <sighs> Some think that this episode was written in response to an overzealous interpretation of Paul's teaching regarding faith. This extreme view called antinomianism, anto, antinomianism, let me write this hard word, it's hard to pronounce, eh? antinomianism, no, mianism. Okay, the book of James was directed to Jewish Christians. It was directed to Jewish Christians. And we can see that uh, those Jewish Christians had scattered among all the nations. That's James 1.1. James 1 verse 1, you'll find that they were scattered all over. Martin Luther, who detested this letter and called it the episode of straw, failed to recognize that James' teaching on works complemented, not contradicted. Martin Luther failed to understand that this letter of James was complemented and not contradicted. Okay, what does that mean? <clears throat> the antinomianism, they believe that once you are saved, you don't have to, be, to obey any law, the law of the land, secular law, traditions, or any other thing. You are a free, free, free man. You can do anything you want at any time you want them, no rules, no terms, no conditions, and all this kind of nonsense. But we can see that, uh, again, James is coming up, and uh, Martin Luther could not understand him. Why? Because he thought that uh, James is contradicting again by pointing people to the law, but he didn't understood that James was trying to complement just whatever was written. If you have been set free, you have been set free from the law of sin, the law of sin, not the law of the land. You have to obey the leaders as we had seen in the previous classes. You have to obey the law of the land and you have to uh, cooperate, cooperate with other people. Paul's teaching on faith, while Pauline teachings concentrate on our justification with God, James' teaching concentrate on the works that exemplify that justification. Wow. Uh, James, in short, was trying to emphasize on action. The works he's talking about here is action. Uh, you don't have to claim that you are saved, yet you don't show any action of people who are saved. So if you are saved, then you have to behave as somebody who is saved, who is a Christian. Don't behave as a pagan, yet you are a believer in Christ. Don't confuse people. Take a stand. Draw a line. Let it be clear that you are saved. Behave as one of those people who are saved and don't contradict yourself. Don't stand in between. Lukewarm, 
you either be hot or cold and this is what uh, James is talking about and we can see that James was writing to Jews to encourage them to continue growing in the new Christian faith was encouraging believers to continue growing in this new faith in, of Christianity. And so it's about, hey, don't just claim to be saved by your mouth, yet your actions proved other, proves otherwise. Claim to be saved and be saved. Don't just claim to be and you are not. Claim to be and you are. That's what he's saying here. And we can see that... Um, was writing to them to continue in this new Christian faith. James emphasizes that good actions will naturally flow. Good actions will naturally flow from those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me explain here. What James is saying is that good actions is not a matter of pretense. Don't pretend let it flow from within you. Don't fake it outside like people fake smiles. Don't fake it like you are trying to be what you are not, but let it spring forth out of you. Like what the Bible says that uh, out of your bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. Let it flow out of your belly. Let it flow out of your heart that indeed you are a Christian. Don't force it, don't fake it, leave it. Don't speak it, don't uh, uh, make it as uh, just uh, something by the way, make it real. This is what James is saying here by actions. Faith without action is dead, dead, dead. And this is a very great point to note down. Someone may or may not have a saving faith if the fruits of the Spirit cannot be seen. Wow, this is another thing altogether. Saving faith. There are people with faith which is not saving faith simply because they speak with their mouth but their deeds are contrary. They are full of scriptures all over but uh, they don't leave those scriptures. They pass information to people, but their different lifestyle is from those scriptures they quote. They stand in church pulpits and pray, yet and preach, but what they are preaching is not what they are. And this is what is being spoken about here. Somebody may be having, may not have a saving faith if the fruits of the Spirit cannot be seen. What are the fruits of the Spirit? The fruits of the Spirit is love, is joy, is long-suffering. If somebody doesn't have self-control, they cannot control their anger. They cannot control their deeds. They cannot control their flesh. Then those ones doesn't have what we call saving faith. And can, uh, the fruits of the Spirit cannot be seen. Much as Paul describes in Galatians 5 verse 22. Galatians 5:22. You will be able to see the fruits of the flesh. The fruit of the flesh you will be able to see, and the fruits of the spirit also are mentioned there. Let us look at the key verses. The key verses. The key verses. In that James 1, 2 to 3, James 1, 2 to 3, you will be able to see what the Bible says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. That's another great thing there. Count it all joy when you fall into trials because it will produce perseverance. Another key verse is James 1.19. James 1.19, which says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become, to become angry. Wow, this is a point noted here. 
A lot of people are very quick to speak meh, 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 but they are not very quick to hear. The Bible says we have to be quick listeners and also slow to speak. Don't speak a lot of empty words. Don't speak a lot of nonsense, but you must be a good listener. Every Christian, every pastor, preacher, every person must be a good listener. That's why you can be talking to somebody and they are very quick to answer you, but eventually you realize they have gotten nothing at all. They don't listen. Yeah, they ask you the same question. You are answering them. Why? They are very quick to speak. But let us be also slow to control our tempers. This is another thing. Very slow to get angry. There are people who are getting angry so fast and they are like, you know who I am. Okay, so the self in you is still there in existence. You never crucified it because if you crucified your flesh with Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, we were crucified with him. The life we are now living is not us, but Christ in us. But you hear a pastor, a preacher, a brother in Christ, a sister, you'll know who I am. <laughs> of course, you'll know whom they are. But whom they are is the Adamic nature in them, the Adamic nature in them. They don't have that Christ image. They don't have that Christ image who is slow to anger, Christ image who is humble, Christ image who is cool and relaxed in the Holy Spirit. Some guy said, you know, you've touched a live wire. <laughs> I said, wow, this is so interesting, okay? Anyway, don't be a live wire. Be the Christian person the Bible says about you and me. Let us be Christians by our nature, our lives, not pretending to be. Let us be. And so let's be slow to anger. And again, James chapter 2, verse 17. 2, 17 to 18. Aha, uh -huh. what does it say? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith what by what I do. You cannot separate them. Faith and deeds, they go along together. And James chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 3, and verses 5, what does it say? Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. That's another key thing there. You have to note it down. Because very minor issues, they turn up to be very big in families and people quarrel, and I just feel like giving you a story, very short story there. A certain man was living with his wife, and as they were living, one day the wife brought the food right on the table. After serving the meal, the man tasted and started eating, but uh, it, was, it was having a lot of salt too much salt, and the man complained like, hey, your food is uh, too salty. The woman was like, nothing like that. What's wrong with you? That's such a nice food I've cooked for you, you can't even appreciate. And the man was like, I appreciate, but it's having a lot of salt. So, And the wife was, no, it, it doesn't contain much salt. Then they argued over that matter until the wife decided to quit that marriage and go back to her people. And she quitted. She collected all her belongings and she went. And the man was left alone again struggling just because of a simple thing that sparked the argument. And after some years, the man happened to have met this ex-wife once again. And when they met right in the marketplace, and the man said, hi, the woman, hi. You used to be my wife, I used to be your, you used to be my husband, and they chatted a bit, and uh, 
After that, you know what happened? Uh, the man was like, what made you leave me? Come back, let's go and stay together. But the, the, man say, the woman replied, you know, it's you who was complaining about salt, but the salt wasn't much. And the man was like, the salt was too much. And the woman was like, it wasn't too much. And again, they started arguing and they disagreed badly. And everybody went his own way. And that was it. It was over again. Even after some years, they still could not let it go. And that's how their marriage was completely destroyed. So the Bible is very categorical here that uh, a very small thing can spark great, uh, great fire or great argument. And that's why we should avoid them. And uh, with this point that is saying here, a tongue is very little but can do great things. So let us not keep speaking evil. Let us not be cursing our brothers in church. Let us not be cursing our sisters, our family members, people, talking bad about people, talking bad very fast. It's today in today's society so common. But let us stop this. Let us avoid this and just be speaking blessings, blessings, blessing. I bless you. I bless you. Long live my brother. Long live my sister. Let us be Christians who are happy. And lastly, James is saying in chapter 5, verse 16, chapter 5 and verse 16, James is saying there, the prayer of a righteous man has great effect. And now let's go to the summary of this book. The summary of this book, we can see James outlines the faith walk through genuine religion. Faith walk through genuine religion in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to 27. I've said James outlined the walk through genuine religion. Again, he's talking about genuine faith. I think I should write these ones down. I'm speaking about summary. And we can see that James is talking about Genuine religion, genuine religion, which we find in James 1, 1 to 27. James 1, 1 to 27. And again, he's talking about genuine faith. Genuine faith. which we can find in James chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And also you can find it in chapter 3, verse 12. Chapter 3 and verses 12. And again, we can see genuine wisdom. Genuine wisdom. Where do we find that genuine wisdom in chapter 3, verse 13? Chapter 3, verse 13. And also you can see in chapter 5, verse 20 to chapter 5, verse 20. You start reading from chapter 3, verse 13, then you go, you read past chapter 4, then you go up to chapter 5, verse 20. You'll find it there. This book contains a remarkable parallel to Jesus' sermon on the mountain in Matthew 5, 7. Matthew 5, 7, it's talking about uh, the sermon on the mountain, and so it's saying this book contains remarkable parallel 
to Jesus' sermon on the mountain. James begins in the first chapter by describing the overall of all overall traits of the faith walk, overall traits of the faith walk. And in chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3 discusses social justice and a discourse on faith in action. And he then compares and contrasts the difference between world, worldly and godly wisdom, which of course godly wisdom is far much higher than the worldly wisdom. And we, what we need more is heavenly wisdom or godly wisdom as opposed to the worldly wisdom and ask us to turn away from evil and draw close to God. James gives a particularly severe rebuke to the rich who hoard and those who are self-reliant. Finally, he ends with encouragement to believers to be patient in suffering praying and caring for one another, and bolstering our faith through fellowship. Bolster, bolster our faith through fellowship. Now we want to finalize this book by going through what we call practical application. Practical application. Practical application. Wow. We see in the book of James a challenge to faithful followers of Jesus Christ to not just talk the talk, but to walk the talk. I'll repeat. The challenge to faithful followers of Jesus Christ, not just to talk to talk, but to walk the talk. Okay, this term is sounding like a tongue twisting, but I'll just note it here. Practical application. Don't talk to talk. Don't talk to talk. Talk to talk. But rather, but rather walk the talk. Don't talk to talk, but rather walk the talk. While our faith walk, to be certain, requires a growth of knowledge about the word, James exhorts us not to stop there. Many Christians will find this episode challenging as James presents 60 obligations. James is presenting 60 obligations in only 108 verses. James presents 60 obligations in only 108 verses. He focuses on the truths of Jesus' words in the sermon on the mountain, which I had said before in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. And uh, it uh, also motivates us to act upon what Jesus taught. The episode also puts to rest the idea that one can become a Christian and yet continue living in sin. Wow, that one is also very clear. If you are a Christian, you are not supposed to continue living in sin, exhibiting no fruit of righteousness, such as faith. James declares is shared by the demons who believe and tremble. This one is again powerful in James 2.9. James chapter 2. Verse 9, he says, even demons obey and tremble. They believe and tremble, yet such a faith cannot save people. I believe in God, so what? Even demons, they believe and they tremble. But 
what's your faith if it doesn't have action? If you still live in sin, then it is meaningless. It's not a saving faith. And in actual sense, it leads to death. This is what uh, James is saying here. Yet such a faith cannot save because it is not verified by the works that always accompany true saving faith. True saving faith is accompanied by works in Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Mm -hmm. God works are not a cause of salvation. Good works, sorry, good works are not the cause of salvation, but they are the results of salvation. Good works are not the cause of salvation, but they are the result of, uh, of salvation. And up to that far, we come to the end of our class today. And I just want to thank you all. God bless you. Let us keep on the passion, the zeal to study the law, the word of God, and God will bless you so much. Let's just pray. Father, we are grateful to you. Bless us all together. Thank you for being with us all through the class. Bless our class and all the students. It's for your glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Shalom.